When we talk about the sources of color, we sometimes refer to idiochromatic versus allochromatic sources. Idiochromatic means self-coloring, and that means that there's a major element in their formula that causes the color. Olivine is an example of that. The iron in the olivine, a major element, causes the color. Allochromatic refers to small impurities in minerals that cause the color. The pure or solid solution mineral would be colorless, but a small impurity within it causes the color. So here's some examples of idiochromatic colors. Copper, another transition metal, can cause different colors. Copper in azurite occurs in two coordinations. There's a fourfold coordination, that's these little plates here, and either five or sixfold, depending on how you choose to express the structure, which are these darker polyhedra here. And this gives rise to the blue color. Malachite, also copper, also idiochromatic. The copper exists in fourfold, these little plates, and sixfold octahedral coordination, and that's what gives rise to this green color. So even though both have copper, they have different coordinations, different structures, and consequently they have different colors. Here are some examples of the causes of pink or red colors in minerals. Rhodochrosite with manganese, cinnabar with mercury, erythrite with cobalt. So just as the same element in different crystal structures can cause different colors, azurite versus malachite, different elements in different crystal structures can sometimes create very similar colors, rhodochrosite, cinnabar, and erythrite. And here's another example with more orangey colors, chromium and vanadium in crocoite and vanadinite. So if you had to predict which of the following sulfate minerals would be most strongly colored, which of these would you predict? And the answer is calcanthite. Here are pictures of all of these minerals. Here you can see it's a beautiful blue color. Again, it's caused by the copper transition metal in its chemical formula. Now, garnets are an interesting case. They can be both idiochromatic, almondine, spessartine, uverovite, which is a calcium chromium garnet, or they can be allochromatic. So if we take grossular, which is a calcium aluminum garnet, in its pure form, it's white, but if we add tiny amounts of other elements to it, the colors can shift to brown, green, yellow, or sort of a cinnamon color. Here's an example where a small amount of vanadium will make savorite garnet green. Nominally, its composition is grossular, but that tiny bit of vanadium causes the green color. Chromium causes colors in many different minerals. A small amount of chromium in beryl creates the gem emerald. It also creates the green color in the mineral fuchsite. Fuchsite is a chromium-bearing muscovite. But in ruby, which is corundum, it causes a red color. Again, the structures are different, so the interactions with light are different. This green mineral out here is a chromium variety of zoocyte, which is a calcium aluminum epidote group mineral. Here's the example I was talking about before with ruby. A small amount of chromium absorbs in the blue to green region. There's a series of transitions and it emits in the red region. And so here are some examples of natural rubies. Okay, so that summarizes the crystal field theory with the electron energy levels. Next, I wanna to turn to defects. There are many different kinds of defects, but in this case, we're talking about either a an electron that is present where it normally isn't, or if an electron is missing in a location where it usually is. If it's present, we call that a color center, and if it's missing, we call that a whole color center. Here is an example in fluorite. Purple fluorite commonly occurs when a fluorine ion is missing and it has been replaced by an electron. This electron has an unusual environment and consequently it has different energy states that are capable of absorbing or fluorescing light. And this is what gives rise to this purple color. Sometimes this is called an F-center, which means a Frenkel defect, and this is a Frenkel defect. 
Smoky quartz has a whole color center. In this case, radiation drives off an electron from an oxygen atom that is close to an aluminum atom. This leaves a hole, and so the energy levels in this region are capable of absorbing many different wavelengths of light and causing the quartz to look black. The story I always tell my students is that my dad used to work at Oak Ridge National Lab. He was investigating the effects of radiation on chemical catalysts, so he had access to many different sources of radiation. One day he took some quartz crystals, which originally were clear, and he irradiated them with a gamma source and turned them smoky. So now we have some artificially smoky quartz as a family heirloom. Okay, that summarizes defects. Now I want to talk about molecular orbital theory or charge transfer. Color in sapphire reflects charge transfer between titanium and iron. These are not part of the formula. The composition of sapphire is essentially Al2O3. These are only trace constituents, and so this would be an allochromatic source of color. Now, if you add a little bit of titanium to sapphire, it doesn't change its color. If you add a little bit of iron, it changes to a pale yellow color. But when you add both, it turns blue. And what happens here is that the ferrous iron and the titanium both substitute for aluminum, and they can undergo this charge transfer, where iron 2 plus can transfer an electron to titanium 4 plus and change the valences to iron 3 plus and titanium 3 plus. This gives you a higher energy state versus a lower energy state. This absorbs red light energy and allows blue light energy to transmit. Kyanite also shows the same kind of phenomenon, although it can also be a, an Fe2 plus, Fe3 plus charge transfer. Lapis, which is the mineral lazurite, a variety of sodalite, reflects charge transfer among sulfur atoms. So here's the composition. It's these sulfur atoms that are able to transfer charge around. And this is what gives rise to the blue color. OK, so now we've covered everything up through molecular orbital theory. Now I want to talk briefly about band gaps. The notion of band gaps is that electron energies occupy a range of energies referred to as the valence band, but there is another band of higher energies called the conduction band that is separated from the valence band by a band gap. The conduction band allows electrons to move, which is characteristic of metals and other conductors. Insulators, which are not conductors, the band gap is so large electrons can't enter Many sulfides and oxides are electrically conducting, and in this case, the conduction band actually overlaps the valence band. In this case, it's very easy for light to be absorbed, and consequently, these appear dark. If there's a small band gap, electrons can transfer from the valence band to the conduction band, and when they drop through the band gap, they emit light. Usually, the band gap is pretty small, which means that the energies are fairly small, and this corresponds to the red or orange or sometimes yellow region of the color spectrum. And consequently, minerals that have band gaps either don't show any color or they show this red, yellow, orange type of color. So here are some examples. Sulfides, pyrite here, oxides, ilmenite here. They have no band gap, so they do not transmit color. But these minerals, orpiment, which is an arsenic sulfide, or cinnabar, a mercury sulfide, these do exhibit band gaps, and so they do have color. OK, so that's band gaps. Last thing I want to talk about are physical imperfections. 